Hello again, everyone. And it's my pleasure to close us out today with two wonderful leaders in the education sector. We have Amy Lloyd, who is currently a special assistant to Secretary Cardona at the U.S. Department of Education. But a little JFF plug, she worked with JFF for almost a decade in, um, up until last year when she left to go to D.C., uh, was a vice president of programs at JFF. And so we couldn't be more proud to have her in the role she is in today. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you. <laughs> And Monique Humphrey, who is the Executive Vice Chancellor and Provost at the Austin Community College District. Um, we had an opportunity to spend some time at one of your campuses yesterday. It's a tremendous institution. So thank you for joining us as well. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Great. And so just to kind of kick us off, um, you both are in so many conversations and get to talk to folks who are really, you know, living this on the ground. I feel we've had a great set of conversations today, but kind of at the 30,000 foot level. And so would love for the two of you to kind of bring us home by like helping land the plane here around like, what does this mean, you know, for the day to day in education? And so let's start with you. What excites you about kind of where we are at this moment? Well, I'm, I'm really excited about um, the opportunities that we have right now. I feel like we're in a very unique space. You know, uh, when we started the pandemic, uh, I've always joked with our, our faculty and said, you know, if someone had asked us for an estimate of what it would take for us to transition to online learning for the entire institution, we probably would have given them a two-year time frame for professional development, but the pandemic accelerated everything. And so I've really been impressed with uh, the way that um, um, the college community uh, has really rallied around our students. And so uh, when I think about the things that are most exciting for me right now, uh, I, I get many, many questions about our new partnership with Tesla. So from a workforce development perspective, we have a 14-week program where students can come and complete uh, advanced manufacturing training with Tesla. And so that gives them a chance, uh, once they start in the program, they become employees of Tesla through that 14 weeks, and then when they finish, they're ready to take on a job at Tesla. They're eligible for full-time employment with Tesla. So, you know, changing the game, I, I understand with our students, they're facing so many more challenges than I faced when I was in college with food insecurity, housing insecurity, and transportation challenges. With us being here in Austin, you can imagine how the housing prices are. And so affordable housing is a real challenge. So the more learn and earn opportunities that we create for our students, I think that's one of the keys to helping improve overall success. But our students have uh, re uh, really, re it, it resounds with our students this opportunity. And uh, they're just really excited. And then the other thing that I'm really, really excited about, in the summer we will launch our Make It Center. And so uh, what this is, in addition to, you know, a lot of people have um, centers where it's like a fab lab. That's not what this is. This is a place for you to test drive your career. If you're in high school, middle school, you're an adult learner, you can come in and let's say you've heard about mechanical engineering, but you don't know what they do. Or you've heard about advanced manufacturing, but you know, I'm not quite sure what that means or you know, whatever. You can come in and get hands-on experience to test drive your career. And so uh, we're really excited about that and to have that space, a safe space where people can come. And I, I think the key is to be uh, able to make uh, STEM and STEAM more accessible and less scary for so many of our students. That's terrific. You know, I was just at Austin Community College yesterday, and I can say firsthand what powerful work they're doing and how exciting the work that Monique was just describing is and will be for students. And I, I want to echo her excitement in that, uh, you know, on behalf of Secretary Cardona, the Biden-Harris administration, all of us see this as a unique moment of time to really reimagine education. Like the pandemic has brought so many challenges to all of us in different dimensions, but it's also created a tremendous opportunity to hit a reset button. Like if ever we were going to shake up education, break the systems that haven't been working for many people for far too long, especially people of color, people from low income backgrounds, people who are first generation college goers, we know that we can and need to do better for all of our students. And now is our time to really rethink education and rebuild systems that work for people. And so I'm excited about this moment because the pandemic has given us this 
really unique space where we have the funding. There's $40 billion out in the field uh, of HERF dollars, the Higher Education Emergency Relief Fund dollars. There's $122 billion, I think, of ESSER dollars, the Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Funds. The funds are there. The moment is here. We've had to already reimagine what it means to deliver education through new means where time and space may need to shift a little bit. What happens when you're learning outside of a classroom and remotely? How do you learn in the workplace? How do you connect careers to education more and more? And this is our moment to really think about what it means to ensure that all students have purpose self-determination, connection, community, tied to who they are and what they're learning and how they're learning it. So I, you know, I'm excited about what we might do in this moment to not go back to normal. Please, 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 let's not go back to what we think of as normal in education. Let's, let's take this moment to transform and do right by our learners. And I know both of you have really focused so strongly on equity throughout your careers. And, you know, I think in this moment we have both, you know, bright spots and we have opportunities for improvement. And we'd love just to hear your thoughts on that. Like, where do you, where do you feel optimistic and where do you feel we need to continue to really push? I know for me, uh, I think higher ed in general, uh, one of those uh, inflection points was the George Floyd, George Floyd murder. And we saw many higher ed institutions respond with statements, uh, statements of support, statements. Uh, but I also saw many people looking to see who was moving beyond the statements to action. And so one of the things that really was compelling to me about Austin Community College is their faculty um, and, the, and the college community came up with uh, a pledge and a commitment to equity and diversity in 2016. So, you know, they weren't just responding to that moment. This is something that they uh, set a vision for a while back uh, collectively uh, across the board and said, this is something that we're committed to. And ACC is one of the few co uh, colleges and universities less than 10 in the nation that have a truth, racial healing, and reconciliation institute. And so building those cross-racial relationships um, and having the safe spaces to, to learn from each other, uh, to build relationships, and to understand how we move forward. We understand that this is not easy work. Uh, that's the, the first thing. There's no um, uh, paint-by-number solution. Uh, for equity work. Uh, it's very difficult work. It's very taxing work, uh, but it's very necessary work. So I'm really committed. Uh, I'm, I'm excited. Even though this is, um, it's been a challenging moment, especially for those that are doing the DEI work every day. It, when you're giving of your soul, it, it leaves a spot that if you don't take time to replenish yourself. And for, uh, for me, it's been a matter of uh, having to engage in radical self-care because sometimes there are microaggressions and other things that happen on a repeated basis that you have to deal with, that you have to take time and say, you know what, that's enough for today, and uh, replenish yourself. Um, and so uh, I think that even though there have been, like ACC is definitely a leader in this space, but we recognize we have so much more to do. I would say we're at the 10 yard line and we have to go 90 more to get that touchdown, but uh, I'm, I'm still very proud of the work that we're doing. Absolutely. Uh, and as, as I mentioned previously, like we've known f for decades that uh, outcomes are too often predicted by race and by place, um, by socioeconomic status in our education system and frankly in our workforce as well. And uh, if anything, the pandemic has shown a light and, and exacerbated, frankly, long-standing inequities that have been in our education and workforce system. But it's also given us the opportunity to think more critically about what it takes to address these inequities, to really boldly kind of reimagine how we uh, bridge the incredible opportunity gaps that have been long-standing for far too many people. And so I, you know, I am cautiously optimistic about what Monique was just describing, how our nation has um, come face to face with who we are and who we want to be and how we're going to get there through the lens of ensuring equitable 
access and inclusion in education and workforce across the board. I'm proud to be you know, part of an administration where on day one, our president signed an executive order to advance equity in the federal government. And it's part of our charge and foundational to who we are as an administration is ensuring that we are working every day to make education and our connections to workforce development and economic development more diverse, more accessible, more inclusive, so that people can thrive regardless of who they are and where they come from in our systems. So I, you know, getting to travel across the country and hearing from people firsthand about, yes, the challenges of the pandemic, but also how they have worked together across different stakeholders and communities to address those challenges and really rethink what it means to you know, meet people where they are and help them get to where they want to be in their education and career journeys is really heartening. There's a lot of innovation and a lot of people-centered practices that have emerged because of um, the crises that we're all living through. And I think we, we can all agree, right, that these challenges are so complicated, right, and entrenched that no one system or department or institution can tackle it alone. Uh, and so we'd love to kind of switch over to, like, focus on those partnerships. And so before coming to JFF, I was at the um, U.S. Department of Labor for a long time and spent a lot of, you know, interagency conversations uh, back then with my peers at education. And I know, Amy, you're doing the same now. So we'd love to, like, how do you think about those cross-agency opportunities? How do you, like, I think particularly around, right, this topic of workforce education, right, like with labor and commerce, maybe just give us a sense of how that's taking place in the Beltway right now. Absolutely, and I can assure you that since they all took office, Secretary Cardona, Secretary Walsh, and Secretary Raimondo have committed to working closely across education, labor, and commerce, and have charged our senior leadership across those agencies to do the same. We are doing all we can to ensure that we are aligned in policy and strategy and in kind of opportunity so that we are you know, de-siloing the systems that have persisted far too long in the field in silos. We want to model what we want to see in communities, right? We want our states to work across education, both K-12 and higher ed, labor, economic development. We want locals to do the same. We know it takes a village, right, to, to raise a child, to build a pathway, to create thriving, strong communities and strong economies. And yet we know that our funding has sat in silos, our practices have sat in silos, and so we are working every week uh, to ensure that we are in lockstep and, and collaborating to the greatest degree possible because frankly, people don't live in silos, right? We are whole beings. Over the course of one's lifetime, you know, the, the line between education and work is no longer linear, right? Like you don't go to school and then get a job and then retire and that's that. Like it's got to be an ongoing process of iterative learning, reskilling, reconnecting to career advancement opportunities. And we need to rebuild our education and workforce systems so that they're in tighter lockstep, much more responsive to employer and community needs, and uh, more supportive of people across the span of their lifetimes. And so the three secretaries are fully committed to that, as is the administration, and we are working really hard and we welcome your feedback and input on where you're hitting barriers and silos and what we can do to help advance the connection that we know and the interdependence that's essential for this work. And how about you, Monique? I know like Austin, you know, for many years we've worked with different players in the Austin community around like a lot of earn to learn models and different kind of sector strategies and you mentioned the current partnership with Tesla but like maybe talk a bit more about how you're coordinating with local employers and the, your partners. So um, you know I'm thinking in terms of uh, the coordination efforts it's one thing when we work with our industry partners locally but when you think about the the collective impact of the community colleges in Texas. Uh, we're very fortunate to have a lot of cohesion and alignment. Uh, we worked with uh, the Texas Workforce Commission and Harrison Keller, and collectively uh, they were able to uh, work with Amazon to create the opportunity for Amazon employees in Texas uh, with nine community colleges so that they can continue their education uh, through their Amazon Choice program. So uh, those are the type of things that are really beneficial that we create real opportunities for students uh, locally and regionally and you see the collective impact. 
uh, being able to have those partnerships, uh, being able to work with my peers in Houston and in Dallas and learn from them, whether it's uh, P-TECH models, uh, whether it is employee relationships, all of those things matter. Um, because we realize uh, the great thing about community college is we don't necessarily see each other as competitors, but we treat each other as peers and colleagues. So they've been instrumental in helping us say, you know, we, we did this working with this partner for this sector, this might be effective. So all of those things have been uh, tremendous in helping us build more learn and earn opportunities. I think those are going to be one of the differentiators for students because they recognize those brand names, they come to us wanting a, a better quality of life. And the more learn and earn opportunities we have, the more it removes some of those other barriers and challenges that students have uh, that block completion. Uh, one of the other things that we've done is uh, we're really trying to bring STEAM, uh, STEM to life. And so one of the recent partnerships that we've engaged in is uh, going across disciplines. Uh, again, I believe the future is interdisciplinary, forcing someone to be in one uh, look at one piece. Um, th the world doesn't work like that. Uh, when we think about the confluence of emerging technologies, that's where companies are able to get their competitive advantage. So when students are able to have a multitude of uh, tools in their toolkit, that makes them stronger. So one of the things that, we, that we're doing to bring STEM to life is we're engaging in a uh, partnership with our local HBCU, Houston Tillerson, and so, uh, and then also with uh, COSI, one of the largest science museums in the nation. And so, the partnership that we have will be working with the dancers. Um, and so, imagine the dancers dancing to Michael Jackson Thriller on the stage. And then our uh, game design students at ACC uh, and the programming students will put the bodysuits on them with the sensors to track their movements. And so in advance, we will program the drones uh, to move in a drone swarm. So as the dancers are on the stage, we've got the drone swarm above that will mirror and replicate. So imagine the thriller movements and you can have a good time with that. So no matter where you are on the spectrum, you get to see. And we also, we always encourage our students to move. Our students are already creative. They're already innovative, but giving them the tools to understand how to turn that creativity and monetize it for their own purposes. We don't need to be patriarchal, just help them to self act they already have the talent and the creativity. So with that, one of the things that we are encouraging them to do is having uh, many, many opportunities for uh, workshops along the way so that uh, adults, students, middle schools, middle school students, we shouldn't put a limit or an age limit on when people can contribute to the innovation economy because they're already ready. They're already excited and many of them, they consider themselves uh, entrepreneurs and hustlers. So giving them the tools and the equipment to do that so they can take those workshops and they can say, I helped to program that drone. I helped to capture the movements of that dancer. I was a part of the dance troupe. And so seeing themselves in the final product helps them to move from consumer to creator and bringing STEM to life. That's an amazing example. We can sign Amy and I up to like. All right, well, we need some more Amy. dancers. Yes. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> well, we need everybody along. This is the beauty of that is when everybody owns the outcomes. Mm -hmm. Well, and I loved your phrase, the future is intersectional, or uh, interdisciplinary. I think I had it intersectional in my mind because the intersectionality of the diversity of who we are as people is also essential to that. Um, and I've got to say, like, spending yesterday at ACC and thinking about the role of community colleges in the education workforce ecosystem is so exciting to me personally. I attended two community colleges myself in my own higher ed trajectory, but uh, to the administration overall. And the role of community colleges as connectors to opportunity and to ensure that people have meaningful access to explore who they are and where they want to go and who they want to become, and then create space for them to do so um, is so important. Our, our community colleges, we know are engines for economic development. We know they're responsive to employer needs. We know they're more nimble um, in kind of creating programs that really meet student needs too. And so we're really excited in the administration to elevate the importance of community college and the you know, incredible wealth of opportunities that students can avail themselves of at community colleges, such as the one you were just describing. So yes, thank you for your leadership and for you know, what you're doing to help inspire community colleges in the state and the country. Thank you.
So one last question to kind of wrap up our morning together. So if we kind of fast forward five years and we're here sitting at South by Southwest 2027, what would you like that headline to be or where would you like us to be kind of as a field at that moment? Uh, for me, I, I would say, um, I would hope that we could say from cradle to career, new inclusive models for workforce development help to expand our innovation economy. Oh, I feel like I'm just gonna sing your song here, Monique. Uh, I, I was going to say something along the lines of like demography is no longer destiny and education and workforce outcomes, right? Like we can no longer determine because of you know who you are and where you come from, where you're going. And I really am excited about a vision that the secretary holds and the administration holds for strengthening college and career pathways that better blend and blur K-12, higher education, workforce development, and meet community needs. And so I, you know, I could envision a headline of like, every student graduates with a post-secondary credential and a vision for their future in you know, five years from now so that we see tremendous connection of purpose and identity and connection to um, economic opportunity in every single student and no longer you know, see the inequities that have perpetuated in our system for far too long. Well, that's a great way to end. I want to thank you both for being here. Thank you so much for your leadership. It's really terrific to have you here. Thank you all who joined us today in the room, online, and in the metaverse, of course. And I hope you'll all join JFF at our event, Horizons, which is going to be June 7th and 8th in New Orleans. We hope to see you there. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.